Um, hi, uh, everybody. My name is Mei Ling Loco. You can call me Mei. Um, you know, the title of my presentation this morning, All That Shimmers is Gold, um, I think shimmering is a really interesting phenomenon that happens in the process of water treatment that I'm going to talk about that is indicative of a process that it's, something is going to work. Um, it's it's what, what you see visually. It's the cue to know that coagulation um, is going to happen. Um, and, you know, like Gail, I think that um, the context for this symposium um, is, is really important for the way we actually organize to affect change in communities um, and to transfer research, this bi-directional transfer from academia to, to industry and into communities. Um, so the metaphor of coagulation, which is really a process where things that are negatively charged, and I think it's wonderful to think about it that way, negatively charged particles actually come together, they're neutralized or they become positively charged. Um, it's the process of making something that is invisible solid. Um, it's a really um, appropriate metaphor for the project I'm going to talk about. So the, the story really begins with um, women home-based enterprises, uh, where I'm from, in Ghana, in West Africa. Um, and it was important, this project was important because it, it opened up a sector of Ghana's economy, um, the way women are um, rewarded in terms of their economic participation within the larger society and what that shows about how the country runs, who runs the country, um, and how value or capital is circulated within that economy. Um, so the woman's status and her participation in the economy is one of the most valuable symbols for understanding um, that context. And in Ghana, it's, it's really interesting to look at um, sort of divisions in terms of um, the employment sector to understand um, how women participate. So, you know, this is sort of national statistics in the country. Um, men are typically um, paid, uh, if they're employed, 20% 20, 20 of uh, men are paid, whereas only nine women are paid in terms of employment. Um, a lot of women work um, as unpaid um, labor in the country. Um, but if you look at people who work for themselves, and that's really in the informal sector, um, you know, that, that those numbers or those percents just begin to balance out. Uh, when you look at urban um, African cities, and Ghana is a great example, um, women in the informal sector um, who have essentially control over their lives, livelihoods, and the, the way their income is um, spent, um, we can see that agency. Um, so this company called Global Mamas, it's a great name, um, <laughs> begins with women who have to work at home. Um, so they typically integrate um, childhood, rearing, um, training, um, home life with this economic activities. Um, and this, this organization, Global Mamas, began to link up women home-based enterprises, and they began as six women. Um, and they basically produced high, really high quality handicraft. So you can see here examples of textiles, although textiles is their biggest one. Um, they do soaps, uh, jewelry, all sorts of um, sort of homegrown high craft technologies. Um, and they've become incredibly successful. 90% um, of their profit, um, they're, they're basically fund, run on 90% of their profits generated through selling these goods. So what began in 2006 women is now over 600 women. Um, the latest count was from 2014, so it's probably gone even more beyond that. Um, and what's really interesting about these home-based enterprises is um, in, in urban areas, they've become um, larger groups. So the groups I was working with were a group of 40 women who began to rent an entire house and make use of, you know, co-producing to cut down costs and distribution. All of these things that you, you can imagine with a distributed economy just begins to grow exponentially. If a, you know, a batik product isn't good, they have to send it back um, across miles uh, in the country to, to get that product uh, redone. Um, and so th those type of wastages in terms of distribution costs, they've sort of um, consolidated consolidate that in, in groups. So I tell you, these women have been experts um, for um, understanding how to implement wastewater treatment. Um, because they were in urban areas and they were quite large um, groups, 40 women, you can imagine that there would be some environmental challenges. Um, so the textile industry, you know, when you're dying, you're putting in heavy metals, um, coloring agents, all these kind of stuff that enter the water stream. And after you get a beautiful product, what's left in terms of waste uh, that is seeped into the gutters um, in the community around them is a huge problem. 
Um, so the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana began to impose limits because of odor control, um, sort of um, the sludge, um, all sorts of effluence that was flowing away from these houses. Um, so it was a huge challenge. Um, if you look at some of the, the bad stuff in that water in terms of um, color, heavy metals, um, the pH, if you imagine all these toxics going back into the, the urban um, waterways, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, so this is where my company came in. I have a company in Ghana called Willow. Um, and what we do is we find applications for agro waste um, in, in building technologies, and in this case, water treatment. Um, and agro waste is a, it's a huge, I think it's one of the most, most underutilized resources that we have um, on our planet today, and it's so closely associated with our growth. The more we grow, the more food we, we consume, and the more waste we produce. Uh, so for every uh, mega, megagram of biomass that we generate for food, about two-thirds of that goes into waste, which is a huge problem, as well as an opportunity. Um, I've mostly focused on, most of my research on a very exciting agro-waste called uh, coconut husk. Um, you know, since I, I did my PhD at RPI and I was missing home, so obviously I brought the coconut research to RPI. Um, <laughs> And it's not the most widely traded or produced, um, but there's a lot of interesting characteristics around what is composed in that agro waste. And I think, you know, for the purposes of this work, coconut was a great case study in actually identifying what's valuable in the waste and using that for different applications, in this case, the building sector. So um, in Ghana, we started looking at a natural coagulant called the moringa plant. Um, and moringa is this uh, white leaf. Um, fast-growing, abundant plant uh, all over Ghana and in many areas around the world, along the tropical, hot, humid region. And it's like this magical tree. I, I can't, every part of this tree is used for something um, from tea to oil to um, cosmetics. Um, and it just keeps growing. The more we learn about this plant, uh, the more we realize it's a superfood that we literally have never seen. Um, and you can find that today it's being sold in the United States in Whole Foods for tea, um, for the kind of stuff that you use as spirulina in your shakes. It's become associated with a nice green hippie culture. I'm all for that. Go ahead. Um, but it's driving the production, the supply chain from, Af um, from parts of Africa like Ghana in a whole new, on a whole new scale. And what's associated with this production of these um, tea and oil products is this waste. Um, so this shell, when you ground it down into um, a press meal, uh, gives you something like a flour. It looks like almond flour. And the company producing, a fantastic company called Moringa Connect, producing these products um, has no idea what to do with, 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 with the flour. Um, and you know, in conversations with um, global mamas and understanding what their um, available means to treat their wastewater streams, we realize that cost, obviously, is the biggest hurdle. Um, the competitive technologies right now in Ghana are these synthetic co coagulants or flocculants that are imported. And if you look at the costs, um, you know, 700 CDs, which is about $200 per kilo, this is not something anyone, a small home-based enterprise, can, can afford, versus Moringa um, press meals virtually free and grown in, in a lot of rural and semi-urban areas. So we began doing a lot of testing with um, optimizing the dosage of the Moringa with these textiles. And I, I tell you, it was a huge failure for a good two months. Um, and then we started to get a few things right, um, understanding what pH conditions Moringa would work within, what dosages, the mixing rates. Um, and I'm not going to show those results because we haven't published them yet, but um, it performed much better than any of the synthetic flocculants. The only thing we realized is it produced a lot of sludge. I think somebody who's a water expert can, can speak to this. Um, but our research is now focused on developing building materials out of that sludge. Um, and so we also worked with the women, not just to develop the, uh, on our end, developing the technology, but understanding how do we implement this. Because fine, you may have a, a local product that works great, but getting people to adopt it and instill confidence is a huge challenge. It's probably the biggest challenge. And so we began to bring the women, the Global Mamas, um, into the process of designing the system itself. And so these had to be affordable um, um, systems that they could easily make with materials that um, were within their surroundings. And you know, the women instructed me on everything. We looked at ergonomics designs of the chairs, because um, they had a lot of back problems associated with dying um, at a low height. Even the tilt of this table here 
very little things uh, like that. They were incredibly instructive in how to produce these tables. Um, so, you know, poly tanks is where we store water. The, um, it's, it's incredibly cheap. The metal, metal industry in this area, Ashaman, which is one of the most resilient um, upcycling um, regions in, in the city, um, all the metal was made <laughs> down the road. Um, and it looks like I'm in control here, but no. Um, the women were literally just like, that's not going to sink. Um, your, 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 your sieve device is not heavy enough. Um, you know, they, they really, um, they bought into the process and they took ownership of it in a way that meant that, you know, the actual sustainability and the practice of treating um, the wastewater um, could be um, sustained over time. And we looked at integrating that into their, you know, daily cycle so they could, they could actually meet their production goals for the day. Um, and then we, we looked at ways in which the designs were actually more encouraged social behavior because the dying on, on one station wasn't exactly the most pleasant um, social experience. So, I mean, I think, you know, I moved away from the object in this presentation, which was the tables and the systems and um, the design of what we're calling the Global Mamas Fair Trade Zone, which is an attempt to centralize to some degree the production because of the high distribution costs within that company. Um, but I think, you know, in thinking about what the role of a creative, an architect, a designer is within these, e these ecosystems, um, you know, there's certain skills around how do we build these alliances way before, um, you know, the actual project, whether it's a design build or um, the design of a water treatment system. How do we set up the, the organizational framework in a way that everyone has a lot of control and contribution to that process? I mean, I think, um, you know, at RPI and I think with, with um, folks um, working in the architecture industry, architecture without boards, architecture and frontier specifically, we've, we've began to under, understand what, our, um, what, our, what can be gained through this process. Um, so I just want to end with this diagram and talk about it. Um, this, I talked a little bit about co-design um, and I think that really transforms um, the agency we traditionally feel as architects we have or designers we have in, in this process. It moves away from a de designer as an expert to a, um, a collaborator. Um, there's a lot of um, value to be gained in bringing in the, the actual clients into the evaluation and monitoring of their system so that it's a high quality robust system that can be sustained. And from an academic perspective, I think we're learning really interesting ways of um, uh, crafting design research, um, wherein there is a methodology to design that um, is informed by the context that we're working within. Um, and so um, that's what I, I've been setting up at RPI, a way to work with sort of startup companies in the Global South, Willow in Ghana, and um, with collaborators here. And I, I hope, given the context of this panel, this is the beginning of some of those discussions, but thank you very much.